Mr. Pond Balls. Tell me Here what we go, going live. To make all my lunker late dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Lust, the Pond Balls, checking in <coughs> live <laughs> from North Texas here at Pond Balls World Headquarters. Hope you guys are having a good Wednesday. We got a line of showers coming and uh, looks like we're going to get rained on again, which you know what? Tim Stewart's watching it from Brazil. Must be summertime there, or I guess it's kind of headed into the fall there, isn't it, Tim, in the Southern Hemisphere? Good to see you, buddy. Uh, I thought tonight I'd talk about everybody's favorite topic, aquatic plants. Woohoo! And do they play a role in your pond management plan and in your fishery? So you know the drill, you guys. Looks like we got five folks. And let me uh kind of rev up my laptop here so I can see everybody that's coming on and figuring out what's going on here so I can say hello to everybody. But you know the drill. Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine in the comments section. Click like and please share this video to your timeline so we can build an audience and share all this information. There's Eli Bridges, my cousin's son. I guess that makes him a second cousin. Brian Lawrence, good to see you, buddy. You guys bring your questions up. We got nine people looking on so far. So um, let me see here. Bear with me a minute because I think I see it. Oh, there it is. There it is. We got 13 folks now. Sweet. And you guys know the drill. If you do those things, you're eligible for a mug, Palm Boss mug. And I say it every week. It knows how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. I don't know how it knows, but it do. Looks like Jennifer, Eli, Jacob West is checking in. Marta, hey Marta, our next door neighbor, Jason, Jason Went, Mepstad, Nepstad checking in. There's a hat. Here's a mug. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine. Click like, share it to your timeline. You're eligible for a drawing. There's Matt Hines checking in. Good to see everybody. So let me see here. I'm going to scroll down here and see who all we got. There's Fred Bingaman. Fred's still hanging out in Maui. I think he changed locations, which I don't know if he forgot to pay the rent and got kicked out or found a better gig. <laughs> Love you, Fred and Connie. So, um, and Marta, I hope the real estate business, hey, if you guys are looking to buy or sell a home in the Metroplex, especially on the northern side of the Metroplex, Frisco, McKinney, Allen, in that part of the country, go find Marta Howe. She's our realtor and she knows what's going on. Justin Stain, fisheries biologist with American Sport Fish Hatchery. Good to see Justin on here. Scott Hohenzee with Karina Mills. Scott is an as astonishing guy. I mean, I can't believe how much stuff that guy gets done. He works with Karina Mills, and he handles the uh, uh, wildlife side, which also includes fish food. So he's feeding big deer, you know, game birds, that kind of stuff is what he does. There's Scott McClurg checking in from from uh, up in Lincoln, Nebraska area. Troy Seal, what's up? Hope you aren't drowning from rain. You know what? The rain is just tracking south of us, moving north. So it's going to be uh, raining on us here in a little bit. You know, being a pond guy, I mean, I never complain about the rain because as soon as you do, then it quits raining and then you're in a drought. You know, and this is my 40th, 41st year of doing this. And I can distinctly remember three droughts and all three of those droughts were broke, only broken by flood every single time. And right now, man, I'm telling you, we keep... we. It, it rained three days last week, had the weekend off. It's going to rain a couple of days this week, maybe into the weekend. So we're going to go into the spring with all our ponds in our part of the country full. Now you go down into central Texas, the hill country, and going west and southwest from there, they're in a little bit of a drought. You know, not a severe drought, but a drought nonetheless. Chris Baker from Indiana, Mike DeMint. Hey, Mike, we were just talking about the... Uh, Institute of Higher Pondology, looking forward to hanging out with you here in about a month and a half. I'll be sending you some information on that. Folks, we got three slots left. We can make room for four more for the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology. If you haven't thought about coming and joining us and you're really interested in pond management, interested to the point that you want to do it yourself or you want to be involved in the business, you know, come on. It would be a good thing for you. Fred Bingaman is uh, on the way to the airport. Many prayers for your buddy around him, and yeah, you know what, boy, that was scary. I, my, uh, uh, I'll have to tell you about Ryan. Ryan and I have been friends and colleagues, and he's been a client of mine probably for ten years. 
I've helped him with his lakes in North Carolina, off, North Carolina, off and on. And he, uh, he, you know, he's just a sponge to absorb knowledge. And when I saw that wreck, and you heard the first reports, I got to thank him for he got me out of watching The Bachelor with my wife Monday night. But I sent him a text today, and I said, in the text, I said, I never thought I would be so relieved to see a friend in a hospital gown smiling with his two baby girls. And within five minutes, he texted me back. He said, thanks, pal. I appreciate it. So I got to hear from Ryan today. It sounds like he's going to be great. And, uh, man, I'm, I'm so excited for Ryan. It's, uh, you know, when you, 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 know, you know it's a dangerous sport, but you really don't wrap your brains around how dangerous it is until you see that wreck, you know, or until you see other wrecks like it. You know, when you spend two times and you get T-boned while you're flying at probably 120 miles an hour by a car going 160 miles an hour. I mean, how can you just, you just, you can't wrap your brain around that. Let's see here. So Fred, say flight. You're going to fly at night. Let's see, it's five hours earlier. So it's, it's 6.30 here. So it's about 1.30 there. Uh, you're going to be sleeping in an airplane. Justin Shank doesn't have Wi-Fi from the pond. So I guess you can watch it on your phone. Jason Jones, where is this training class at? Let me tell you where it is. Here's a scoop on the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology. I've thought about this probably since about 2005 or six. Then we had a number of Pond Boss uh, conferences where we brought in a bunch of people. I thought it would be smarter to kind of tone it down a little bit, make the classes smaller, fewer speakers, more information over a longer period of time. So here's what we're doing. It's gonna be based at our home at Lusk Lodge, comma two. We have 4,600 square foot of uh, inside space. Plus, we've got outdoor space. We've got eight ponds. Got a little cabin. So what the deal is, on the Institute of Higher Pondology, you guys are going to convene at our office first on Thursday, April the 2nd, for a mostly all day long inside basics of pond management classroom time. Then we're going to go to our house where everybody's going to settle in and we're going to have a cookout. Uh, maybe even do a little bit of pond management. Probably going to be more about getting to know each other. We did one in the fall, and that's what we did. The weather was kind of lousy in the fall. And I'm hoping April 2, 3, 4, the weather's a lot better. So, uh, and then on Friday morning, we'll have guest speakers and some inside stuff until after lunch. And after lunch, we go outside, and we're going to do hands-on things like aeration systems, putting feeders together, what's it like to build a dock, water chemistry, Going to learn how to handle fish. Going to same fish. Uh, we may launch the shocker boat. We may not. But on Saturday, it will go uh, about five or ten miles to a 14-acre lake that Mike Otto built, that I designed, and we stocked about five years ago. And we're going to go do a full-blown survey on that lake. We're going to electrofish it. We'll set some nets. We'll do some saning, water chemistry, and you guys get to analyze that lake and figure out what's going on. You'll get to identify a bunch of different fish species, plant life, look at some habitat, water chemistry, and we'll tie all that together for you to where you really have a, a, a much, much more in-depth understanding and knowledge of how lakes work, how water works, how the fishery works, how the plants work, and how all that comes together into a community. It's $1,500. Now, you got to get here. And as long as we've got room and we're filling up in the house now, we've got room to sleep, I think, 12 people. And I don't know if those, all those beds are taken yet or not, but the $1,500 includes space if we have it and all your food, transportation from here. But, you know, some guys will bring trucks, so we'll, we're not going to go very far on our field trip, so that's not hard. And, uh, uh, and I see Ron Ardoin checking in. Ron has volunteered. He, he's bringing his dad and one of his running buddies. Ron's in the pond management business when he's not offshore in the oil field business. And he's going to cook a Cajun meal. You know, so we're pretty jacked up about that. we got a great outdoor space. I see Chris Stillman checking in. Kevin Briggs is checking in from North Carolina. But Jason, that's pretty much the thumbnail sketch of the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology. Now, if you don't want to spring for the $1,500... You can come to the Thursday session, which lasts about eight hours in a conference room at our table. And that's all indoors, PowerPoint presentations. Uh, and it's mostly going to be me talking and showing you images 
of everything you're going to learn as we get out in the field. But we're going to have a lot of field time. John Henry says the ponds are full in North Arkansas. I bet they are. You guys that's been training on top of you guys. Mike DeMint's coming. Mike is coming to the Institute. So is Ron. I see Ron on here as well. Talk about him. Let me make sure I haven't missed anybody here. Checking in. So I do want to uh, go back to Purina Mills since we've got Scott Hohenzee. We usually have three or four of the Purina guys checking in, and I'm sure we will um, as we go along. But Purina, one of the things I love about Purina is the fact that they have always been receptive to working with us to make fish foods for our industry. And that's what they do. I mean, they have the best research farm. They're doing fish food work right now as we speak. They're comparing different types of fish foods to see how they can make theirs better, which it's already converting like at 1.3 to 1. You know, one of the things Purina has led the field in has been first place down the track with developing fish foods where you can have a feeding program. 25 years ago, you couldn't have a feeding program. You could go buy some fish food, target game fish, or you could target non-game fish. You know, grain-based fish foods like channel catfish, tilapia, fish like that, or game fish like bluegills and hybrid stripers and fish as those. Well, now they've got it where not only can you feed different species of fish, you can feed the different sizes of the different species of fish. Let's see here, uh, Charlie from Camdenton, Missouri. Good to see you, Charlie. Jim Schusler checking in from Innsbruck. Uh, email back and forth with Chris Chavetta today. Jason Jones, awesome. I'm going to try to make it. Man, that would be great. If you would, call our office tomorrow and talk to Leanne or send me an email at boblusk at outlook.com or info at pondboss.com and we'll send you the information and in, in things that you might need, and things that you will need to get ready. Jim Schuster said, when you talk about the best food for bluegill, does pellet size make a difference? There's Jerry Olert checking in. Jerry has been a videographer for us off and, off and on over the years. And like the uh, last Palm Boss Conference, he was the uh, video guy and he edited a bunch of videos, put them up there for us. Good to see Jerry from San Antonio. Jim, the best food for bluegill that Purina has developed is Aquamax MVP. The thing I love about that fish food is not only does it have the best protein sources such as fish meal, it's got nine different pellet sizes. Now, my favorite thing about MVP and feeding bluegill is when you're feeding bluegill a floating fish food and you see them erupt on the surface in warm water, all you're seeing is the biggest fish. What you don't see three feet down are the fish that are shy or not quite as aggressive, more passive maybe. So what Purina did was they developed a fish food, this MVP, where some of the pellets are considerably smaller, about like that, and they slowly drift through the water column as they sink, and the fish can gobble them up as there's an eruption going on three feet above them. Let's see here. Jerry, I don't know when I'm coming to South Texas, but when I do, I'll ring your number, buddy, I promise. We can go eat some good Mexican food and catch up with each other. Scott McClurg from Nebraska saying, I've been reading a lot of info about nano bubbles. Do you have any thoughts on them? You know, Scott, I've begun to study just a little bit about nano bubbles. Now, it sounds like to me it's a little bit pricey now for what you get. And, and I've got to do more homework because I understand the concept. The concept is extracting oxygen from the air, sending it through a micro diffuser that breaks the bubbles up to where they go into, uh, where they dissolve it immediately in the water. But what I'm not convinced of is how far that oxygen migrates into the water. I don't know that. I don't see it. I don't get it. But I'm working on that. There's uh, Danny Mack checking in. Danny was at the last Institute of Higher Pondology. Glad to see him. And there's Drew Hay checking in from Pennsylvania. Drew signed up with he and his dad today. They're going to make it down here in April from Pennsylvania. Drew and his guy Phil Hay and uh, sons are in the pond building business in Pennsylvania. You can find those guys online if you're in the, oh, I don't know, within 100 miles of where they live, north of Pittsburgh, I think. They're, they're, they'd be happy to talk to you about how to build a pond. At 6.45, and I told you I was going to talk about aquatic plants, and I haven't got there yet, so let's go, let's go on that topic. 
when you guys have questions, pitch them out there to me, and I'll see them, and uh, we'll talk about it. Uh, when I, my training in college was in aquaculture, fish farming. What I thought I was going to do back when I was at Texas A&M from 1976 to 1979 was I really thought that I would be in the fish farming business. Jerry Oler, what's going on is the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology, <laughs> which is a pretty cool deal. We can talk about it one of these days, or you can read about it in the magazine or online. Um, anyway, uh, in aquaculture, it's pounded into your head that you don't want plants. Plants get in the way of harvesting your crop, but aquaculture is about trying to grow fish for specific purposes, single species. So it's like trying to grow catfish for food. And if you've got aquatic plants and a catfish pond, it clogs up the seine and it fouls the taste of the fish. So you're taught to keep the aquatic plants out. On, on commercial fish farms, they're either using an approved herbicide, but if they're raising the fish for people to eat, they're going to avoid the herbicides and usually use grass carp in there with the channel catfish to eat the vegetation. Now, channel catfish, they're, they're really not. They're not plant eaters. They're more meat eaters with a tendency to, uh, if they can't get meat, then they're like, like a teenager, they'll eat broccoli if they have to. You know, but when you're feeding fish in an aquaculture system, you want to be able to harvest the fish and not affect their flavor if you're raising fish for people to eat. And otherwise, you're raising bluegill in, a, in an aquaculture situation. Or you're, um, or you're raising bluegills for sport fish. Or you're raising largemouth bass. And you're raising one species of fish in that aquaculture pond. So you don't want aquatic plants in aquaculture. And it took me three or four years to begin to really figure out that, that in a fishing pond, aquatic plants the right kind of aquatic plants actually add to the habitat. They're good escape cover for newly hatched fish, especially in the spring, going into the end of the spawn, you know, all the way into the second or third week of June. It's real important to have some plants. Let's see what Chris ragoni has got to say here. Chris is saying, I'm in the middle of building my second pond. Should I leave a few small strips of topsoil for vegetation? It would be about six to eight feet deep in clear water. Um, I don't want plants growing in six or eight feet. I'd much rather see those plants growing in four feet or less. Now, one of the thing about strips, you can, if you can, if you can build a ledge or a ridge that sits, I'd compromise even at five feet. But if your water is so clear that you can see down six feet, it's too clear to provide the food chain base for newly hatched fish especially bass, bluegill, red ear sunfish. You want a good plankton bloom in the spring, which here, 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 here's, here is a primer about aquatic plants. Aquatic plants need sunlight, they need food, and the right temperature. So what we're getting ready to see before long is we're gonna start seeing the temperature rise and certain plants start to grow almost every single time it's algae. I got a, a text over the weekend from one of my clients over near Jacksboro, Texas, showing me where filamentous algae is just now starting to grow. You know, and, and he doesn't like it. Well, we got a cold front coming, I bet a dollar to a donut that that temperature is gonna drop enough to take those plants out. But we're on the cusp of the temperature rising enough to be on the upswing to where algae is gonna start growing. You know, now when you start seeing filamentous algae, you're probably three weeks away from, four weeks away from other kinds of plants beginning to grow. Cattails will start to grow around the edge. Right now, they're all dead. They're all dormant. But you can bet when that temperature is perfect, they're going to grow six inches to eight inches a day, and it won't take a week before they're six feet tall. You know, so aquatic plants, we want native aquatic plants. And if we have our druthers, and if you're, if you're building a lake, you know, like what Chris is talking about, you want the least amount of water three feet deep or less as you can get. Well, what that means is if you got a three to one slope going down, that means you're gonna go down about three feet, which means you're out nine feet, which means you're gonna have the potential to have a ridge of aquatic plants growing around the pond. That's a good thing. Put some topsoil on that slope and you'll get some good plants. Then you can manage the clarity. There's Mike Rosa checking in. I didn't say hello to Jennifer a while ago. I saw Jennifer was on. See, let's see what Barry Mouse has got to say. 
Let's see here. Barry Mouse looking for some plants to put in my new pond for protection of the bluegill fry. I heard Louisiana iris was a good choice. I'm in South Louisiana. What do you think? Absolutely. Louisiana iris is a great choice. American pond weed is a good choice. Now, Louisiana iris is going to grow along the edges in really shallow water. So it won't be quite as protective as American pond weed would be or as eelgrass would be. So if you can get those two plants growing in South Louisiana, Barry, you're, you're going to have it made, buddy. Let's see here. Harrison Davis, buenos noches, Mr. Pombos de Norcross, Georgia. Good to see you, Harrison. Harrison's in the pond management business over there. Let's see what else we got going down here. Okay, Danny Mac, hi Bob, me and my bud just finished 3, 000, or 300 square feet of bog filter. That's pretty cool. I have another 200 feet of bog. So what Danny Mac's doing is he's got a small pond in his backyard with a, with a lot of elevation going up a hill. Well, he's created a rocky stream, and in that stream he's creating some beds to where he can plant some bog plants like Louisiana irises or arrowhead or... Um, uh, some different kinds of lilies, things like that. Blooming plants, fantastic areas, which what that does when he pumps the water out of his pond up into the headwaters of the stream, it goes through and filters through these bog plants, which helps clean his water up, which means he can feed more fish. So let's see. Um, Ron says, Ron Ardwan says, how do I get eelgrass to grow on an underwater ridge in two to three feet of water? I'll tell you what you do is build an exclusion fence. Go find some. You can order eelgrass online. Uh, talk to Jason Nepstad. He did that. Jason's watching this show. Uh, and he can tell you where to order it. But build an exclusion fence. Because if you're going to start planting plants in a new pond, odds are high that the turtles are going to snip them off before they can really take root. So build an exclusion fence. And what I would do there, Ron, is I would go get some... Uh, let's see, you said that's two to three feet of water. Go buy some 36 inch tall, one by two inch welded wire and make a cylinder and put it together with J clips, just like they use in hog with hog pens or rabbit hutches and things. And plant your eelgrass and then take that cylinder that's 30 inches in diameter and put it right over the top of that eelgrass, push it down in the mud a little bit, but leave it up where you can see it. And when the eelgrass takes root and begins to spread, then you pull it off. And after the, after the eelgrass gets started, odds are good that it's going to begin to be able to move. And rather than make one great big exclusion fence, make several small ones. Because it's much easier to handle a 30-inch cylinder than it is to handle a 60-inch cylinder when you're trying to get it in and out. So do it, look at it that way. There's Willie Howe checking in. Marta checked in a while ago. Willie, good to see you. Tom Davis is checking in from Ohio. Amy Butler, good to see you. We got 45 people that I know about and probably 200 that I don't. Heck, Ryan Newman might even be watching. Hey, Ryan, if you're watching, man, here's to you, buddy. We love you. I'm glad you made it. Glad you're happy and glad you're uh, hanging out with your girls. He, uh, Ryan has got this very cool lake in front of his house outside of Statesville, North Carolina. And it's just stunning. It's, the setting is beautiful. And every time he gets a chance to get out there with his girls, they love to fish. I've got a picture of Ryan that I use quite a bit that uh, shows him with his little girl, his oldest one, when she was probably three, holding up a really nice bluegill that he caught in his, in his lake right there in Statesville. Aaron Schulte's checking in. Danny Mac likes the answer. Woohoo! I don't know which one you like, but I'll take it uh, I guess it. what I did. Thank you very much. So let's just kind of talk through the, the principle of aquatic plants. And now my computer just crashed. Great. So I'm going to stay on the phone and see what's going on here. Drew Hayes, looking forward to the pondology and hanging with the pond boss. Thanks for fitting us in here, man. I'm glad you're there. There's Jose Trump. <laughs> Jose, good to see you, man. I'll be voting for your Uncle Donald. <laughs> Okay, so my computer has just crashed. It's going to have to reboot, looks like. Well, let's just go back and talk about aquatic plants. We'll just battle through this a little bit. The thing you got to know, like I mentioned earlier, plants need three things to grow. They need the right temperature, which means temperature is a big deal. They need sunlight penetration, which means depth is a big deal. And they need food, which is what you're going to find in topsoil. Most of the time, when I did, I'm getting ready to go help a guy west of Tulsa, Oklahoma, design a brand new lake. 
And I can tell by looking at his site on the maps, that guy's got lots of topsoils that'll be in the basin of that lake. So we're gonna have a discussion about what it would take to, to cut some of that topsoil out and use it on top of the dam after the dam is built. And we'll just see what we can do to minimize the amount of topsoil because plants are gonna grow in that topsoil. Now here's the, here's the skinny on aquatic plants. You really want them where you want them. You don't want them to grow where you don't want them. Now that sounds pretty simple, Captain Obvious, but here's where I'm going with that. You want about 25 to 30% of your pond with habitat. Habitat means things that your fish that your that your fish need to be able to spawn, to hide, to loaf, to congregate, to travel, which means you need travel paths as well. And the different species and the different sizes of those species, they have different requirements. So bluegill, for example, are colony spawners. They love to spawn in gravel or uh, what they don't like to spawn in is loose mud because they like to be able to keep their eggs aerated. So they need spawning beds and they spawn in colonies. Now bass are solitary spawners. They typically spawn in a nest like a crater and in solitary. I've seen them spawning in five feet of water on top of a big tree stump. When the lake was built, tree was cut off five feet under the water level. And there goes that computer again. So we want aquatic plants to play a role in that. We don't want it to be all of it. We want them to play a role. So if we've got 15 to 25% of the perimeter or the surface area of the pond with native, healthy aquatic plants, that's a good thing. And what you gotta figure out is what's healthy in your part of the country. What's native and what's healthy. We want to avoid exotic plants or we want to avoid invasive plants. Invasive plants are things like milfoil. Um, it affects if native plants like coontail can be invasive. Frank James says, how does liming affect plants? Uh, I'll tell you this. There's some plants that would let, rather live in acidic soils, while there's other plants that won't live in acidic soils. So, like for example, slender spike rush, bladder wart. Those are two kinds of plants that thrive more in acidic water than basic water. You cannot have cara in your pond if you don't have adequate amounts of lime. So, yes, it makes a difference. Is southern water grass healthy? Yeah, I think southern water grass is okay, especially in South Florida. So, be picky about which plants. Now, what I usually tell people is that you want to choose plants that are native and you want to let them grow on their own. And if they can grow on their own, without you having to put them in there, that's a little bit more natural. Let's see, Harrison Davis said, today I found about three dozen one inch bluegill in an old aerator compressor housing unit. Those savvy little things. Yeah, you know what? Those one inch bluegill were probably spawned three weeks ago. That's what's interesting about that. So when you're talking about South Georgia and fish growing and spawning, that's, that's, that's a pretty cool thing there. So now, talking a little bit more about aquatic plants, I like to see them growing with diversity. Um, Richmond Mill Lake in North Carolina has probably got 15 different species of aquatic plants, and they pretty much live in harmony. When, when this one starts to look like it wants to take over, like they do have bladder work because that water is 5.3 pH. About the time the bladder wart looks like it's gonna take over, here comes these tiny little silver dollar shaped snot bonnet, frog bit that we call it. And there's enough fragrant white water lilies growing along the edges and water 18 inches deep and less that the, that the tannins of the water prevent them from growing in water any deeper than that. So it's all working in unison. And aquatic plants are real important as part of your habitat. The, uh, uh, Diversity is good, you know, but I think what I would challenge you to do is figure out which plants are the healthiest plants and which ones you want to avoid. 
Avoid things like uh, don't ever don't ever get hydrilla. That'll that'll take a pond out and be the most expensive mess you've ever made if you use hydrilla. I know anglers love hydrilla, and in some public lakes that fluctuate 30 or 40 feet a year, it works fine, but not in your pond. Avoid Eurasian watermill foil. Um, in some areas of the country, curly leaf pondweed can be a problem, but the thing I've seen with curly leaf pondweed is it will grow fast and fill up an area, and then when the water temperature hits its, its top for that plant, they begin to die back and something else takes its place. One thing I was going to tell you a while ago about filamentous algae is um, it's, it's, it's common for me to get a phone call this time of year from somebody saying, hey, I really want to take this filamentous algae out. My first question is, are you fishing? Well, yeah, but I'm fishing out in deep water because that's where the fish are. Okay, well, if we take that filamentous algae out and with, with an algae side, some other plants are going to get a jump start and catch up and pass that algae. So basically, what I see sometimes, and I see this quite often actually, mats of filamentous algae are growing in areas where if we take that algae out, within about six or eight weeks, you've got obnoxious amounts of, of uh, things like bushy pondweed. The bushy pondweed's a native plant, but man, that stuff can get thick and dense and three feet water and shallower, and it can cover up a shallow cove within about eight or 10 weeks of it growing. Where what the filamentous algae does is it keeps the shade on it takes up nutrients and prevents that stuff from really taking off and becoming an issue. You know, so filamentous algae can be a good thing in the spring, but here you kind of got to make a judgment call with those plants. If they're around the dock, they're in your way, and you can't get in the boat, you can't cast from the dock, then you want to treat those plants. Now, keeping in mind the, the three big things, food, temperature, and sunlight, Sunlight's the biggest, easiest thing for you to manage. If we can keep a plankton bloom on your water early in the spring to where you, your visibility is two feet to two and a half feet, 24 to 30 inches, then we minimize the risk of aquatic plants growing in water deeper than that. So what a plankton bloom does is it helps provide the basis of the food chain that you need for your newly hatched fish to be able to eat. So when you've got a good plankton bloom and then in the spring plants begin to grow in that shallower water, you've done a couple of really, really important things. You've you provided the food chain for your baby fish because a brand new fish has no body fat stored. All it's got is the, what used to be the yolk of the egg. When it absorbs that yolk, it's got to eat or it's going to die. And it can die within an hour if it doesn't have food. Well, when you're, when you're about 12,000 per pound, you're about that big, where are you going to get your food? You got to glean it from the water column or pick it off of a plant or, or some substrate somewhere. So what happens, Kelly Duffy's checking in. Kelly's our go-to guy about all things aquatic plants. Guess what I'm talking about, Kelly? Aquatic plants. That's right. Here's a toast. I've got a little cough syrup. Um, Christopher Aguilar, Boudin Man checking in. Uh, so when you've got a good plankton bloom, then you're feeding your newly hatched fish, which is going to give them the nutrition they need, which is going to increase your survival rates, which is going to give you more forage fish for your game fish 60 to 90 days in the future. What the aquatic plants do is give them a chance to have a place to hide, to keep from getting eaten too early. Plus, some of the good plants like eelgrass, American pondweed, leafy pondweed, um, um, Louisiana iris around the perimeter to some lesser extent, arrowhead, uh, some of the less invasive lily pads. Paraphyton grows on the stems and underneath leaves of the leaves of those plants, where the little fish can come peck food off and get it. Berry Mountain. So I don't know if I need to fertilize. I did last spring and got a bloom. Should I do it again this spring? Chris Aguilar, where's my hat and mug? I don't know. Did you win one? I have to go talk to Leanne. Leanne, if you're watching this, check out Christopher Aguilar. He says he needs a hat and a mug. I guess we need to draw his name today. Or maybe we already did. Heck, I don't know. Um, going back to Barry's question, the way you judge that is you measure measure visibility. Man, I should have brought a Sechi disc in here. I didn't think about it. Get Everybody get a Sechi disc. S-E-E-C-H-I disc. Get that. 
So much rain in Louisiana this winter is miserable. Water's muddy, man. It's that way everywhere around here. I get it. I get it. So anyway, Barry, what you do is check your visibility. Now, buy a Setchy disc. If you guys are going to manage your ponds, you need a thermometer and you need a Setchy disc. Check your water temperature at the surface. Check it three feet down, six feet down, nine feet down. If you don't want to spring for a YSI oxygen meter and spend 1500 bucks, go look online and get one at the Boat Cycle or somewhere like that. Just one of those long glass ones with a hoop in the end, tie a string on it, and check your temperatures, and then have a Setchy disc and measure your visibility. Now, let me tell you how to do that. The Setchy disc is about 12 inch disc that's got an X in the middle, opposing black squares, opposing white triangles. When you lower it in the water, you watch it till it disappears and you raise it up just enough where you can barely see it. That's your visibility depth. And what you're gonna shoot for in the spring when the water temperature is above 55 and going up, you wanna watch your water begin to turn green where the visibility decreases to 30 inches. That's what you're after first. Now, if you're checking visibility, temperature 62 degrees, visibility's eight feet, fertilize. Visibility's four feet, fertilize. Visibility's 36 inches, wait. See what happens with it. So if, you're fertilize, if your visibility right now is eight feet, then the water temperature hits 60, and then visibility's four feet, wait. As long as your visibility is decreasing, then your fertility is likely increasing. And when that's happening, oh, actually your fertility is not increasing. The plankton is increasing that's taking up the nutrients in your water. So that's the way you need to do that. Let's see, anybody got any more questions? I've kind of lost my time frame here. It's got to be close to seven o'clock. And my, my computer is completely collapsed. It's gone. I don't know what's going on. Hit the restart button. It ain't starting. So I'm going to shut it down and forget about it which means I have no idea what time it is, so I'm gonna kinda of play it by ear. Somebody let me know. Chuck Brinkman, I did like you said, and I created several spawning areas with pea gravel. Now I'll have vegetation and canopies over the spawning areas. Will bluegills spawn under a canopy or should I remove the plants? Watch the bluegills, because they're gonna tell you. Um, they're going to, oh good, Drew, thanks. The uh, bluegill will spawn under a canopy but they won't spawn under a dense mat of aquatic plants. So, thanks Josie, appreciate it. 807 where Harrison is. All right, so uh, if you will watch the bluegills, if they can navigate through that dense aquatic mat, they will, and they'll spawn, which I actually like some aquatic plants in the middle of a spawning bed. I think that's, that's kind of helpful because that gives those fish an immediate place to hunker down the babies can rise off the beds, have a place to eat, have a place to hide. But what you don't want is you don't want those plants to inhibit spawning. Now that's what I'll often tell people. Hey Adam Chandler from Cincinnati, Ohio, good to see you buddy. Uh, that's why I tell folks when you, oftentimes I'll tell people when you're building a lake, buy some good quality shade cloth. Put it in an, in, in, in an acre pond, make three or four spawning beds that are about the same size as the hood of a pickup. Put heavy duty landscaping shade cloth down and put about four to six inches of pea gravel, which is about as big around as a cooked pinto bean, on top of that shade cloth. And if you'll do that, then you're gonna have a spawning bed where plants won't grow up in it and it won't be totally filled up with muck and silt as the gravel migrates down. It won't, it won't migrate down. So that's a pretty good tip on how to build spawning beds. And you can do that during a drought it's kind of hard to do it from a boat, but you can do it from a boat or you can wade out there and do it. Because if you're going to build bluegill spawning beds, you only need to put them in two feet of water anyway. So that's the tip on that. Now, going back to aquatic plants, there's, you can look at three, three really basic kinds. You've got floating plants, you've got emerged plants, and submerged plants. Floating plants are plants like duckweed, water lettuce, water meal, azola, plants like that. Most of those are invasive. We'd really not like to have those. Second kind, the submerged plants. Those are the kinds that are the best for your fish. Now they play a role, but there's so many different species. If you want to learn more about plants, go to Aquaplant on the Texas A&M University Fisheries Department website, Aquaplant. 
That's a good, good thing to look at. The third kind of emerged plants, those are plants that are growing out from the edge of the water. Those are like lilies, um, American lotus, arrowhead, Louisiana iris, cattails, reeds, bulrushes. Most of the time, those have a role, and the role of like cattails, reeds, and rushes are to hold loose soils in place so they don't migrate further in your pond to fill the pond up with muck. Speaking of muck, let's see here. Scott McClurg working on my muck removal. Would spawning discs make sense to add and then remove as needed? Spawning discs. You know what? The thing, when he says a spawning disc, that is like in a commercial hatchery, they've got these discs that, um, that they use in hatcheries to be able to collect eggs and take them back and hatch them. Now, as long as the fish will use those, I'd say, heck yeah, use them. You know, now bluegills, I like to have a permanent bed in there so they can use them all year long because when bluegills spawn, we have more bait fish for game fish. Why does it have to be Texas A&M and not LSU? Well, dude, you got the national trophy. You got the best quarterback in the nation. Why do you need a, a plant website? <laughs> Besides, you know what LSU knows? They know about crawfish. You know, Texas a and has done their work on sport fish. So uh, I love LSU. I love your football team. And I love the work that they've done in the on the fishery side. And one thing about... Louisiana, they lean with their laws and their other stuff a little bit too much toward the commercial side and a lot less on the recreational sport fishing side. Commercial fishing guides, commercial uh, fish harvesters, shrimpers, crawfish, that sort of thing. So, all right, um, that's why it needs to be a &M. You guys play football and you eat mud bugs and boudin. That's the way it works. Boudin, man. So now, going back to aquatic plants. And I, I'm not going to dig so far into this that it's not practical. When I'm designing a lake, I set aside places where I expect cattails to grow. I set aside places adjacent to where I'm going to have spawning beds to where pond weeds can grow. I'm going to set aside areas where I don't want any plants to grow. You know, it's like the comment earlier where there's there's a ridge out in the water five feet deep. I'm going to do that sort of thing. Now, I like five feet because it's safe. Even if that pond drops a couple feet, you can still be in a boat, be out in it, and be safe. You know, so you got to think when you're moving dirt around, adding rocks, things like that, you want it to be safe. Now, aquatic plants, not only do I want to come at it from the angle of habitat, they also add to the health of a pond. Let's see. Aguilar is going to be renewing his Pond Boss subscription this month. I know you're joking. So am I. <laughs> Go Tigers. Go Pond Boss. Um, and I, really, I really did love watching you guys play football this year. I really loved watching my Aggies beat you guys last year in 2018, like in seven overtimes. Man, what a game. Woo! And I know you were on the short end of that stick and had all kinds of reasons to complain about it, and I'm glad you did. I'm glad we won. But you know what? I'm really glad you guys won this year because you took them to the cleaners and beat everybody. So enough about football, back to plants. The, uh, uh, the other thing about plants, yeah, that was robbery. Yeah, well, we put our guns up and we took the win. Get over it. I need info on how to kill water shield. All right. You know what, Christopher Aguilar, help me out here. What, what website does he need to go to? <laughs> John, go to the uh, Aquaplant website, which is on the Texas A&M website. Just Google Aquaplant. Go to the University of Google, Google Aquaplant, and it's going to take you there, and it's going to take you to Water Shield, and it's going to give you your options on how to kill it, which there's a combination of herbicides that will really take that out. I just can't think of them right offhand. I don't do that much anymore, but aqua plants a good place to go look on how to manage plants. When I say manage on how to eradicate, get rid of, well, you know what? Let's take a few minutes and talk about eradicating plants. I want you to think about it like this. Every decision, listen to this. This is going to be real important. Take notes, put your beer down, quit watching the Democrats debate. 
and take notes. The decisions you make are going to have consequences, just like when you were 17. You know, you're nodding your head. When you're 17 years old, you made decisions that have affected your life today. The decisions you make with your pond is going to affect your pond tomorrow. So think about that. There's Ben Caskley. He's good to see you, Ben. Ben's in the, I know he's been a fishery student. I know that. Um, so before you decide to eradicate some plants, don't just approach it from what herbicide do I use? How does it work? And how do I apply it? Think beyond that. I'm going to do it. It's going to work. Then what's going to happen? So when you decide you're going to take some plants out, like if you take out that water shield, and, and I'm not opposed to taking out water shield. That can be an offensive, uh, invasive plant. It sure can. You know? So what happens then? So when you take it out, what are the odds that something's going to replace it that you like less? Better yet, what if your fish are using it as habitat you know, for, for your newly hatched bait fish and you take it out in the middle of the spawn. Is that a good thing or is it not? So and, and I'll give you a living example. Of, of, this is a perfect example. I had a dentist call me that lives in Houston, has a weekend place in El Campo, west of Houston. And this is probably eight or 10 years ago now. <clears throat> he called me, he says, Bob, my pond is muddy. He's got a six, a six or eight acre lake. He said, it's It's muddy. And I, I got a jar of, of the water, set it in my garage like you said to do, and I came back the next weekend, and it was crystal clear, and there was about a half-inch layer of dirt laying in the bottom of the jar. He said, what do I do? I said, something's going on where there's, you probably got carp, or you got buffalo, or you got something in there that's stirring the water up. And so he said, well, when are you coming down this way? Well, I was going to go give a speech in Brenham later on that month, so I pulled the uh, electrofishing boat down there and we electrofished his lake and he was packed full of gizzard shad and a lot of water that was less than two feet deep. Gizzard shad love to root around in the mud. That's what they do. They filter the mud. And so his deal was he had so many gizzard shad they were keeping his lake muddy. So he said, what do I need to do? I said, well, first of all, the water's too shallow. If you take out the shad, then you're going to get a bunch of plants. If you get the plants and you take out the plants, then it's going to make more room for shad. They're going to muddy the lake. Well, what should I do? I said, why don't you drop your lake about five feet? That'll congregate the fish. We can get a bunch of shad out. You can let it sit for a few months and get some bulldozers in there and rearrange some of that dirt and make it deeper. And he said, well, I've got about a $40,000 budget. So he worked out a deal with an earth mover and dropped his lake down in May. And by August, the earth mover could get in there and start moving some dirt around. He put enough rope known in at, at a certain part per million where he eradicated almost all the gizzard shed, heavy on almost, didn't kill all of them. And so then that $40,000 budget deepened about oh, a little over half the lake that needed it. So keep in mind, if it's eight acres, he had about four acres of shallow water. He went from four acres to two acres of shallow water. The lake filled back up. He restocked with bluegills. Fathead minnows, still had a handful of gizzard shad, and most of the bass made it through the rope gnome because he didn't use a big enough dose to take them out. Hello, Steve Lewis. Good to see you, buddy. And so what happened was when the lake filled back up, the gizzard shad, it was way after their spawn, so they didn't spawn. But in that two acres, it was still two feet deep. It was summertime, September, October. Guess what happened? Plants started growing up in those two acres of shallow water. He didn't like it. Winter came down there. They don't have much of a winter out in uh, along the Gulf Coastal region of Texas, down southwest of Houston. And so in the springtime, he went in the spring with a whole bunch of bushy pond weed. I'll be dead gum if he didn't go to the store, bought some stuff, bought some herbicides, took the pond weed out after the after the gizzard shad had spawned on it. So now he's got tens of thousands of baby gizzard shad getting bigger and bigger and bigger. His bass grew like crazy feeding on those little gizzard shad. By June, late July, through there somewhere, heck, guess what happened? 
the pond was muddy again. So when he took out those plants, the cause and effect were he spent enough money to half fix the problem. So he still had enough of a problem that the gizzard shad were able to regain their foothold and get the lake muddy again. So he had to live with that. And the last I talked to him, he was thinking about doing another partial rope known, trying to take out some gizzard shad, trying to get enough big bass in there to keep the gizzard shad numbers in check and hope that his water cleared up, stock a handful of grass carp to eat the plants. I haven't talked to him since then. Don't know if it worked. John Shepard's checking in from Missouri. Hello, John. I'm going to look down there on my phone. See here. All right. If you guys have got some more questions, pitch them to me. <clears throat> What's another story? Oh, 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 I'll tell you a story. There was a, a, a guy that called me. This had to be two years ago. And he lived in the hill country of Texas and, and uh, had a pond in North Texas. Well, on weekends, and, he, and he's got family that lives in North Texas around Nakona up along the Red River. And one of his grandsons played football for the Nakona Indian football team, the high school football team. Well, this was just before two-a-day started, and he'd been coming up there on weekends, hanging out with grandkids, doing what he did on, on the farm, which, if I remember right, I think the farm had been in the family for three or four generations. So he would come up, he was in charge of the farm, and then about a three-acre pond, and about half an acre was completely choked up around the dock with bushy pond wheat. So he went to the local hardware store, the Ace Hardware store there, and he bought a bunch of rakes. And he worked out a deal for his grandson and his buddies to come out there with rakes and rake all that pond wheat out. And then for that, he'd have a cookout, cook them hot dogs and hamburgers, and they could swim in the pond. Well, they got there about 8 o'clock in the morning, like good country kids do, and started pulling that pond weed out and they worked on it for about five hours and I bet you they had a box car full of pond weed judging by the pictures he sent me and he piled that piled all that pond weed up on the shore and it was looked like a big haystack. Well the kids got to go swimming they had a blast and this was in the first of August just before two days the kids were exhausted you know they ate all the hamburgers ate all the hot dogs and by the middle of September, almost all that pond weed had grown back. You know, so he needed another plan to go with it. Let's see here. Chris Fargillard might be moving to Dallas soon for a job promotion. Take me fishing. Okay, I'll do that. Chad Bowman finally made it on. I have no plans. Listening from the beginning now. Good deal. Good deal. So, to kind of give you the nutshell, uh my thought process is about plants. We want aquatic plants in our recreational fishing ponds. Now we don't want them in golf course ponds. We don't want them in swimming ponds. We don't want them in irrigating ponds or irrigation ponds. And we don't want them in aquaculture ponds. But if we're gonna have different species of fish vying for space, vying for food, we want some aquatic plants. Your job is to know the plants you've got and then what do you need to do about them? If you've got the right kind of habitat for them to grow, then they're going to grow. They need food, sunlight, they need temperature. So when those three things happen, plants are going to grow. Three types of plants, floating plants, submerged plants, and emerged plants. There's three control methods. Physical methods, like the kids with the rakes. There's weed cutters you can buy. But you got to keep in mind, that's like mowing the grass. If you, if you try to treat ponds with herbicide, or you cut them, or even if you use grass carp, which is about the only biological method you've got right now for most aquatic plants, uh, you, can, you can use tilapia where they're legal. Tilapia will work good where they're legal to eat filamentous algae. That's what we do here. We can use tilapia Mozambique, and they're fantastic for grazing and eating algae converting the nutrients to meat, to, to meat, which in turn creates more forage fish. The third thing is herbicides. Now, if you're going to use herbicides, be smart. Don't take out all the plants at once. So there's your, there's your primer on aquatic plants. We want some. If we've got 20% coverage, that's great. That's more than enough. Now, when does it get to be a problem? When you get about 30% of a pond covered with aquatic plants, 
Now you can't fish it very well. If you get 40 to 50%, it's you're not going to be able to catch any fish. You get beyond 50%, now it's affecting the biology of the pond. Plants, aquatic plants, they produce oxygen via photosynthesis in the sunlight. Yep, my computer's still down, thanks. We're going to wrap it up right here. Uh, they photosynthesize during the daytime, which means they produce oxygen during the daytime, but they consume oxygen at night. So once you get to that point of about 50% coverage, now you're running the risk of having a fish kill because you've got so many plants that if you get three or four cloudy days or three or four rainy days, they can consume more oxygen than what they can produce. You can have an oxygen depletion to kill some fish. Let's see here. Let's see here. Jonathan Stoddard, can you transplant from a nearby pond or lake? Yes, you can. Just be sure you know the plants. Identify the plants before you transplant. And, and I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not opposed to doing that. But keep in mind, you got to have food, sunlight, and the right temperature. If you're going to transplant some ponds around Quitman, Texas, right now is a good time to do it if they're just starting to grow. So I'd say yes. Chad Sepulveda, I stocked my pond based on 12 surface acres, but it looks like I actually have about 11. I have three automatic feeders throwing... It says see more, and I'm trying to read it. Well, it's not letting me. Oh, here we go. I have three automatic fish throwing 40% protein. So do I need to cull some fish or just feed extra? Um, well, here's what I'm going to tell you. You don't need to start culling fish until you're well into year three, and you're only going to be culling young of the year fish or underperforming fish that are three years old. So that means for bass, for example, you're going to be calling fish that are 14 inches and smaller after the third year or deep into the third year, like September, October of the third year. Be sure your fish have reproduced before you start culling any. Let's see. Chris Ragular loves plants. Like it. Cool. Uh, Ron says, be careful when raking ponds. I learned fragmentation. Yeah, bingo. There's John Wilson. Hey, man. Uh, that was the other thing about raking ponds. Eurasian watermill foil, hydrilla, um, coontail, all those plants reproduce by fragmentation. So just because you rake out enough to fill up the bed of your pickup doesn't mean that you solve the problem. All it means is you cut the grass, and if it's a kind of plant that reproduces by fragmenting, then you've allowed it to migrate across the pond and reestablish somewhere else. Let's see. Will grass carp eat parrot feather? Yes, they will. Now, the thing about grass carp, there's a bunch of plants they won't eat. They won't eat cattails. They won't eat floating plants because they can't stand on their tails and reach up and, and eat um, um, duckweed. They won't eat that kind of thing. But they will eat plants like pond weeds, uh, parrot fe parrot's feather. They will eat that. They'll eat most submerged plants. They struggle with coontail, but they'll still eat it. It just takes them longer. What's a safe submerged plant, John Shepard says? I like American pond weed. I love eelgrass. All right, here we go. Mark Primo's checking in. Good to see you. Dan Drolop, I got a two-acre muddy, two-acre pond, muddy clay bottom, always muddy looking water, maximum visibility is two feet all year. Would, let's see here. Would a set you disc even be useful? Yeah, it would be. Now what you may want to do, what you may want to do is take a jar of the water, set it on a shelf, see if it settles out. If it doesn't, you can use gypsum, or some other soil amendments or other water amendments to make those clay particles settle out and increase your clarity. Oftentimes, even with a new pond, if you increase the clarity of the water when it's muddy, turbidity due to mud, then you can increase your opportunity to grow plankton. Well, okay, guys, it's wrapping up close to 7.30, so I'm going to cut out here and see if I can deal with this stupid computer that I'm going to need tomorrow. So um, I'm going to bid you farewell. Thanks for watching. And if you have a topic you want to hear about, send me an email. Send it to info at pondboss.com. And for you guys that want to know more about the Institute of Higher Pondology, send me an email and I'll get you the information and we will uh, get that to you so you can figure out what you want to do. So hey guys, enjoyed it. Fast paced hour. Appreciate the comments. Appreciate you guys looking in and see you later. See you next Wednesday. Adios.